Today we're looking at the Mafia. But not the good or glamorous fellas you see in the films, all action and honour and Robert De Niro cheekbones. In real life, in Italy, the authorities have been trying for decades to take down the different organisations who've essentially created a parallel criminal economy. In the late 80s, it was Sicily's Cosa Nostra. At high speed, the judge reeled off sentence after sentence, totaling 2,600 years for 338 now convicted Mafia members. Whilst the policing focus was there, other groups gained momentum and stepped up their drug trafficking, kidnapping, protection racketeering, like Southern Italy's Andragata. They're being described as bigger than the Mafia and more lethal than terrorists. These are just some of the claims about the Ndrangheta, a crime mob which now outnumbers their famous Sicilian rivals. Now they too are the focus of police attention. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Luke Jones. Today, how Italy is taking down the most dangerous Mafia clan. A large-scale police operation is underway across Europe targeting the Italian mafia group, the Ndrangheta. Prosecutors say it might be the biggest operation ever targeting Italy's Ndrangheta group, one of the largest organized crime syndicates in the world. It's responsible for much of Europe's cocaine trade, combined with systematic money laundering, bribery and violence. Photos released by Italian law enforcement shows drugs, guns and an unknown quantity of money which was seized in the raids. We're talking here about Operation Eureka, which was perhaps the biggest ever raid mounted on Italy's Andrangheta Mafia, involving the arrest of around 155 suspects in Germany, France, Portugal, Romania, Spain. Tom Kington is Italy correspondent for The Times. And it was the culmination of a series of um, raids which involved the seizure of around 23 tonnes of cocaine. That's estimated worth of, well, over £2 billion. Law enforcement authorities in Belgium, Germany, Italy, France, Portugal, Slovenia, Spain, Romania, Brazil and Panama were involved. Lots of different places raided and about 2,770 officers involved. The list of charges behind those arrests is long, including a criminal conspiracy, drug trafficking, firearms trafficking, money laundering, tax evasion, as well as the aiding and abetting of fugitives, including two that were on the EU most wanted list, Europol says. And the specific target wasn't lots of different crime families, it was the Andragata Mafia clan. Correct. So we're talking here about probably the biggest cog in Europe's cocaine importing business, ploughing back their profits into bars, restaurants, legitimate businesses, Mm. including actually, I found out one pizzeria in Rome that I go to quite a lot. So that was (sighs) quite a shock, brought the story home to me. They're very adaptable. So they've been getting recently into using Chinese money exchange systems where huge amounts of cash can be sent around the world in a way that's pretty untraceable. They've been looking into cryptocurrency and also looking at uh, synthetic drugs, all the while hiring Albanians who work in Europe's ports as people who could help them get those shipments through unnoticed. And for for those of us who don't necessarily follow the the ins and outs of of Italian mafia clans, just place the Andragata for us in all the different clans that we might have heard of. The big three in Italy are Sicily's Cosa Nostra, who are very famous. Their heyday was perhaps in the 90s, before they were humbled by huge police roundups. That's the mafia that we associate with the Godfather films. That's the the Sicilian mafia that spread into America in the 20th century. Then in Naples, you've got the Camorra, which is a sort of loose grouping of family-based clans in the city, rather more violent 
quite a lot of youngsters coming through at the moment who have decided it's better to sort of sh shoot and then follow the rules later. Then you've got the Andrangheta in Calabria, in the toe of Italy. The name comes from the Greek word for courage. They date back to the 18th century. And there's a legend, which is that three knights from Spain in the 15th century came to Italy. One formed the Camorra, one formed Cosa Nostra, and one formed the Andrangheta. So the Andrangheta, either way, have been around for a long time. And if you go to uh, the city of Reggio Calabria in Calabria today, you'll find that there's a family, an Andrangheta family called the De Stefano family, which has actually been knocking around, involved in mafia activity since at least the 1870s. So these are not newcomers to the game. How is it actually organised in terms of a hierarchy? Is there a hierarchy? We're looking at about 150 families in Calabria, and that makes up at least 6,000 made men. Made men. Now, if you've not watched your fair share of Mafia films, they're a kind of fully initiated member of the clan, someone who's taken part in an induction ceremony or taken some kind of oath. What happens is that these family clans, if they're grouped together in a particular town, they will come together and they will form what's called a locale. So that's three larger groupings of locale. And each of the mandamenti will have a, a boss. And all these groups, they tend to work together sometimes. Sometimes they're rivals. There have been very vicious rivalries. So back in the 1980s, there was a civil war, basically, between clans that claimed around 600 victims. But often, if there's a huge drug deal to be organized, perhaps they'll pool resources, they'll come together, they've got to ante up quite a lot of money to pay over to the Colombians to get a big shipment going. So there'll be lots of alliances as well. As for an overall boss... Well, it's kind of shrouded in mystery, but in 2010, a man called Domenico Opedisano was arrested and accused of being, at that time, the kind of overseer. And police officers have told me recently that there will be another guy probably now serving in that role. They don't know who he is. This is not a sort of boss of bosses, though. He's more of a kind of arbiter. He's more a person who would settle disputes and step in when rules need to be enforced. He's not the top of a pyramid. Yes. What is the actual business of the Andragata? Because you mentioned drug deals there. Is that their is that their day-to-day -day trade? Has it always been that way? No. If you go back to the 80s, the Andrangheta was very locally based in Calabria. Their main business was kidnapping for cash. So perhaps they would find a rich Italian businessman. Sometimes they would go out of Calabria, they'd go up to the north to snatch these people. They would bring them back to the Aspro Monte Mountains, which rise up in Calabria, full of caves used by shepherds over, over the years. And they would hide these people there and often claim a very large ransom. Now, it, at a certain point, they decided to up their game and used some of their proceeds from kidnapping to open an account with Colombia's Medellin cartel getting into the drug importing business. That coincided with a slight waning of the influence on the drug circuit of Cosa Nostra. The Colombians were getting a bit fed up with the Sicilians because they weren't always regular payers, they weren't mm. that reliable, and they found some very good new sort of trustworthy partners in the Andrangheta. And that was key to the Andrangheta rising up, overtaking Cosa Nostra, and becoming Italy's number one in the drug game. And in terms of Number one, do we know what the scale of their business is? I mean, what's their turnover? There have been various estimates. When I've asked experts what they make of those estimates, they'll say, well, your guess is as good as mine. But one number that's been bandied around is annual turnover of about 53 billion euros. So that's kind of equal to a small country. And that's based on operations going on in about 50 countries where the Andrangheta is active. Mm. 
you've been to to one of their strongholds in southern Italy, in that toe of Italy, as you describe it, a town called San Luca. What was it like walking into that small town, knowing that it was absolutely crawling with these people? Well, it's funny because the Andrangheta is often described as being a sort of invisible mafia spread out across Europe, across the world, tentacles everywhere, but operating in the shadows rather quietly. You don't see it. You don't feel it. But you walk into a town like San Luca and suddenly it becomes very tangible, that presence. It becomes visible. We're not talking about big mansions or displays of wealth. It's actually completely the opposite. What they tend to do is live in very dilapidated looking houses, often unfinished. So they've got that business where they will have started building a, another floor and haven't finished. So you've got some bits of wire and cement sticking out. Very, very often unpainted buildings. You go inside as Police have told me, I haven't been inside any of these houses, but police who have mounted raids have said, you go inside and it's a completely different world. So we're talking about Versace, gold leaf tiles on the floor, gold plated jacuzzis, gold taps in the bathroom. So incredible wealth, mm. uh, but all hidden. And that's the kind of underlying attitude. They want to sort of distance themselves from the outside world, from the state, from the Italian government, and live in their private world of criminality and obscene wealth. You mentioned police telling you about these mafia houses, Tom. Did you spend any time with them? Did you get to have a look around some of them with the police force there? The Carabinieri station in San Luca was opened in 2012, but only after the building site was damaged by fire, sabotage, tools were stolen, which was a clear message from the local clans, we don't want you here. And even now, it feels like a sort of lonely outpost. One of the officers down there who'd actually served with a, an Italian military contingent in Afghanistan said he was reminded of that experience. He said, what you've got to understand is that the Andrangheta down here is a parallel state as the Taliban was when I was serving there. We went to a couple of towns. We went to Africo, San Luca, and another town called Plati, which is just up the hillside from San Luca. And when we got into the, the station of the, the Carabinieri police in Plati, and I sat down for a chat with the commander, and I said, look, can we actually just go out for a stroll? Can we go and have a look at the town? And he said, okay. So we walked up the street. There were a couple of other officers behind us. And immediately, young lads on mopeds started whizzing up and down the street. They would vanish. And then about three minutes later, they would reappear. They were sort of looping around the town, just following us and checking us out. As the commander said, you know, it's a reciprocal thing. We check them out and they're checking us out. So we were really, really under scrutiny. Tom, we've got this criminal clan mafia group, the Andrangheta. You've explained for us how sprawling, how well populated, how profitable they are with all that they're doing in the drug trade and the rest. When did the tide start to turn on them, though? When did police actually get a foothold? I've mentioned that they keep to themselves, they operate in the shadows. That changed a bit in 2007 when a feud between rival clans in San Luca spilled out into Germany, where clans were operating. Six Italian men are gunned down in a German industrial city. Police say the killings were linked to Italian organized crime and that the men were involved with Ndrangheta, a violent clan more powerful than... One faction murdered six members of a rival faction outside a pizzeria in a town called Duisburg. And that really started to ring alarm bells in Europe. No crime syndicate operating within Italy has ever been known to carry out vendettas on foreign soil before. The Italians told me that up until then, police forces in countries like Germany had dismissed the Andrangheta as being no more dangerous than a biker gang. But after Duisburg, everything changed. European police forces started to pool resources, and that in turn led to much bigger and more complex 
and more successful operations against the Ndangata. One example of this is uh, back in 2021 when the Belgians, the French and the Dutch cracked an encrypted phone system called Sky ECC, which was being used by Andrangheta clans across Europe. And they were able to suddenly listen in to all these chats between the gangsters and get the inside track on huge cocaine shipments coming into Europe. It's quite funny, actually, when you read these chats in the documents which were produced as part of Operation Eureka, they're, they're full of emoji sort of smiley faces as another ton of coke arrives in Rotterdam. And these chats also offered a, a very sort of interesting insight into the day-to-day running of these rackets. So, for example, one chat would talk about how cash was going to be taken from a safe in San Luca and shipped up to Munich where it would be used to buy a car wash. One of these scores of businesses that were being set up around Europe to to launder all all the drug money coming in. Or perhaps another chat would involve discussion of cocaine coming in through a port in Calabria before being cut up and then distributed. So it really was a fantastic kind of x-ray of the way they were running things. It didn't stop there. In 2021, there was also the arrest of the clan's go-to coke broker over in South America, a man called Rocco Morabito, himself from Africa, so close to San Luca, but for years based in, in South America. Brazilian authorities have arrested a fugitive drug lord by the name of Rocco Morabito. The mobster was tracked down to a hotel room in Brazil's coastal city of Joao Pessoa, where he and two accompanying foreigners were arrested. It's slightly incredible, Tom, that actually all of this progress seems to have been made in getting inside this Italian mafia group, thanks to police forces from the US and from elsewhere in Europe, not actually the Italian police. I would disagree, actually. I think that what's happened is that the international police forces are now learning from the Italians who have taught other police forces the techniques that they've honed over the years for going after these clans. And I think one example of that is how... The Italian Carabinieri police I met in San Luca do a pretty incredible job on mapping the alliances of the Andrangheta families, basically just writing out their family trees. So when I visited the station in San Luca, I was taken into a small room where they had lots of panels on the wall, um, all packed with very detailed family trees of about 50 local families. And they were explaining to me there how knowing who's related to who, who's married to who, what alliances are rising, what alliances are coming unstuck, was pretty essential to Operation Eureka in Mm. that it would allow an investigator in Germany to figure out who he was dealing with, understand wiretaps. You know, when a guy on a wiretap would say, I'm going to my sister's wedding next week. They'd know who that was. So it's actually the Carabinieri down in San Luca was the sort of the engine room yeah. for all these operations around the world. So if they've got all of that intel and now they've got all these other police forces on board and, and helping them as well, they've also got the scalp, as you mentioned, of Rocco Morabito, their coke broker in, in South America. How did we get to the point that Operation Eureka which you mentioned earlier, actually started to unfold using all of this, I guess. It took months, if not years, for them to build up the evidence they needed from the wiretaps. There was another factor as well, and that was an inside man. So in Belgium, where one of the San Luca clans had been running a pizzeria in the town of Genk, the Belgian police managed to get one of their undercover officers to get in with these guys. And he did that by offering advice on how to transfer cash. He was also able to supply them with cars that had hidden compartments inside for the transportation of cocaine. So he was deemed to be a good guy by the San Luca clans operating in Genk. And what that led to was an invitation 
to this undercover officer to visit San Luca, which was quite a breakthrough because it, I think it's very rare for the police to actually have their own person get into these Andrangheta strongholds in Calabria. The Belgians got in touch with the Italians and said, look, this invitation has been made. What do we do? <laughs> the Italians said, okay, send him down and we will stand by and watch out for him. So when the man arrived in San Luca, the police were all over the, the surrounding hills with binoculars checking to see if this was all going to go tits up, if the guy was going to be found out, if this was indeed possibly a trap. They even had a helicopter on standby for a quick extraction if things went wrong. It didn't. The guy got out alive and came out with some very interesting intelligence about how the clans were aligning at that moment. He also, I think, gave a very interesting insight into the clan's mindset. So, for example, he quoted one guy down there, uh, Marcello Nierta, as saying, the entrangheta is not a bad thing. People only see the negative side, but actually we help poor people and andrangheta members have balls and are very courageous. Another made man, Giuseppe Nierta, gave him the details about the initiation rite that you go through to get into the Andrangheta. It involves pricking your finger, putting a drop of blood on an image of the Madonna, which you would then burn. And he said that when you've done that, you'll be a made man forever. Good grief. And a lot of that information he was able to extract, incredibly incriminating. So that's how, what, 150 of them got arrested in the end. And there was that huge seizure of cocaine that you mentioned earlier on. What is actually happening with those 150 people now facing charges? They were arrested on suspicion of um, drug trafficking, mafia association, money laundering, arms trafficking as well. What happens now is that we get into a very sort of complicated legal process. These trials can take actually years to go through. What may facilitate all this is if we start to see turncoats emerging, i.e. members of the clan who would rather give evidence, perhaps reduce their eventual sentences that way. This is a kind of new phenomenon with the Andrangheta because for a long time, the kind of tight family structure of the organization meant there was intense loyalty and very few people would go to the police. Things are changing, and one of the reasons is that they're so rich now that there's a, a new generation of Entrangheta members who really don't fancy the idea of going to jail. Going to jail was perhaps once seen as a very essential rite of passage for these guys. Now you've got a kind of yeah, new generation. They've perhaps gone to university. They're more comfortable in very expensive hotels. They're not the kind of guys who want to be toughened up in prison, and that may encourage them to step forward and give evidence. Some 500 defendants, 600 lawyers, and more than 900 witnesses in total. Italy's largest mafia trial in decades has begun. There's been another Andrangheta trial dealing with another locale that's been going on for a year or two in Italy, and surprisingly, that featured 25 turncoats, which really is a sign of the times. And so what do you think will be the biggest blow to the clan then? Either the fact that this many of their number are in custody and could be turncoats and, you know, could give further insight into what they've all been up to, or the just over £2 billion loss of, of product that you mentioned earlier, because that must be a big blow to them as well. I was told when I was investigating the story that they think that the police will seize perhaps around 15% of the cocaine which is being brought into Europe from South America. So when we hear the big numbers like 23 tonnes, you've got to think, well, actually, that's not much compared to the entire amount that's coming in. I think that in the short term, 
what this operation would have done is slowed down the Andrangheta operation. And one reason is that the Colombians and the Brazilians that they deal with need to know who they're dealing with. They need mm. to have met these people. So when, for example, Marabitu is arrested, what you've got to do is get the new emissary out there to South America to sit down and break bread with these guys. That's how they operate. It's done on trust. It's done on personal acquaintance. And so right now, there'll be a bit of a pause while they can muster up a new set of ambassadors who can get out to Latin America and set these meetings up. It sounds like you're saying that, that at the moment, the police are winning. In this decades-long war between the Italian police and, and the Italian mafia. It's not quite the way they see it. When I put that question to them, I said, are you winning? And they said, we've won a, a battle, but not the war. And what was interesting is that down in San Luca, they were saying, you can round up as many mafiosi around Europe. You can impound as many shipments as you like. But we think the only way we will finally defeat the Indrangheta is if the very tight-knit clans down in towns like San Luca can be once and for all dissolved. Only then will we see the back of the Andrangheta. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Luke Jones, and my guest, Italy correspondent for The Times, Tom Kington. If you're a subscriber, you can read loads of Tom's work on The Times website, including a long read about which of Silvio Berlusconi's children is set to succeed their father, who died this week. A sort of Silvio succession, if you will. The producer this week was Edward Drummond. The executive producer is Kate Ford. Sound design was by David Crackles. If you can, leave us a review. It helps other people find us. See you soon.